Okay, so um, what we're going to tackle today is The Devil and Tom Walker, and this is kind of a lengthy read. Um, a lot of you who may be watching this who missed uh, honors class, particularly if you missed, uh, we did half of this one day and half the next. So those of you who like were there for the first part of the day may want to fast forward through this a little bit and try to find where we are. But uh, it, a review won't hurt you either. Now, I'm not going to read this like I've been doing with stuff because it's a lot. And to read it step by step and discuss it, we'd probably be looking at pretty extensive videos. So what you need to do before you watch this is actually read you know, this on your own. My advice would be maybe as I'm talking about it to pause, read, whatever you need to do. The story is understandable without me. It's just picking up on some of the nuanced things I want to discuss might be stuff you need. Um, particularly the main uh, like literary element we're dealing with in this is characterization, indirect and direct. Particularly now, direct characterization is going to be where the author tells us exactly what he wants us to know. Um, when he says something like, uh, right at the beginning, he says that. Uh, let me find it. Um, okay. Uh, sinners down upon their knees. There lived near this place a meager, miserly fellow of the name of Tom Walker. So meager and miserly there indicate direct. He's, there's no interpretation needed. We know exactly who it is. Now, indirect characterization, on the other hand, is going to require you as the reader to, to put some thought into it. It always, always is going to come from two particular areas that's indirect characterization. It's going to be what characters say and what characters do. Those two things you have to interpret. You know, When they say something, what does this really tell us about that person? Uh, when they do things, what does it really tell them? We're going to see this a lot when we get kind of in the first few pages when Tom – comes across the devil in the swamp and seems completely unfazed by running into the devil. That's that's indirect characterization because it shows us uh, something about him uh, that he isn't going to run in fear like er most sane people would do. Okay, So we're going to talk about those two things. We're also going to talk about romanticism a little bit, and we're going to build more of this definition as we go. But this is going to be our first getting our toes dipped into romanticism. And romanticism really is going to deal with a couple of things particularly. It's going to deal with the power of the individual. Um, the power, you know, the, the importance of the individual. Also going to deal with a little bit of supernatural elements. Now, the term typically is, is mistaken to believe romantic, like with love and stuff like what we've taken it to be today. That's not necessarily what it means. You'll see in this story, there's no instances of romance at all. Uh, Tom is married and hates his wife. Uh, you can see how much as we proceed through this. Okay, so as we get into this, we're going to point out like uh, some stuff about characterization. And we're also going to look at some of the highlights. This is not enough if you haven't read, though. You've got to do the reading, too, okay? Um, otherwise, you're going to show up for this test, and you're not going to have – you're going to have to end up reading it then, and you're going to run out of time because on the test, you will have to do the matching stuff – or I'm sorry, the multiple choice on the historical section as well as the written stuff within the time you're given, which will be probably 50 minutes. So you got to pick it up. You don't have time to look for stuff. So my advice to you is do the reading, take some notes. You know, and uh, if nothing else, maybe you watch the video and then you go back and do the reading. I, I don't care what order you do it in, okay? So one of the important things we're going to see in this is uh, that is not technically listed. Is we're going to talk about some tone elements, all right? Particularly about how the author, Washington Irving, who's famous for things like The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle, we're going to see some things he does that helps us to, uh, you know, really see um, – uh, I'm sorry, I was making sure I was recording. I just glanced down and thought it wasn't. Uh, we're going to see how he feels, the author feels, through what some of his characters say. So we start out with some stuff, and I talked about this in class. These, this is 1800s writing. You're going to come across these long, descriptive paragraphs. I feel like a lot of authors today have moved away from this because it tends to be off-putting to most readers. But what it does do is shows you how talented of a writer he truly was. Irving is probably the first real like American writer that gets any kind of publicity outside of the country. Um and that's deservingly so. He's tremendous. So that first little paragraph really kind of sets up the uh, location, the setting. It tells us where we're going. It tells us there's this little swampy, foresty area that's got, uh, you know, some kind of negative vibes, some kind of evil vibes hanging around it. We also meet Tom and his wife. Um, Tom is – neither of them are likable, by the way. I mean, we get that they're miserly, which means they're they're kind of stingy. They're greedy. They don't like each other. They try to cheat each other all the time. They live in a garbagey looking looking house that's falling down. They have a poor starving horse they're not taking care of, and they seem more interested in stealing from each other than trying to improve their situation. Um, people going by the house hear them fighting at all hours, particularly Tom getting beat up by his wife. The word they use is they call her a termagant, which is a pretty uh, you know out of 
pocket word. We don't use it anymore, really, not in no normal language, um, but it just means kind of a shrew, a, a nagging woman who just, you know, constantly is berating you. So uh, Tom is constantly getting, you know, smacked around by his wife. They yell at each other. It's just bad situation. Okay. Um, so then we get like when we get past the initial characters and setting, which is what those first few paragraphs are about, which is the common thing with short stories. We get into the actual story elements. And again, one of the things about Irving is he does meander a little bit, getting to the point. So we're going to see him show up in this forest. We're going to get a lot of descriptions of the forest and the swamp. Okay, really what it's designing for us is that this is not a place you want to be. It's a place that's got a lot of negative and scary elements to it. It's got an abandoned Indian fort there, which multiple times they point to the concept. And this is, a, this is an archetype. This is a stereotyped view in this time period of Indian habitation areas as being haunted. Uh, there's a lot about Indians worshiping you know, evil spirits and things like that, which, again, I'm not sure whether that's a uh, – that's a Irving belief that Indians were bad because he definitely has a problem with slavery. We're going to see later. I don't really know what his feel towards uh, Native Americans was. So maybe he does. He does make the, the devil himself, who we're going to run into here pretty quickly, does make some comments about white savages. So maybe this is just, you know, setting up the fact that he really feels like Native Americans are mistreated, too. We talked in the early parts of this about those three essential questions that come at the beginning of this chat of this unit. And one of them is about how um, literature reflects society. So, you know, I talked about how a lot of your writers would have been more progressive people who would have had problems with slavery, who would have had problems with how the native Americans were treated and things like that. And I believe this was written about during the time of Andrew Jackson. So Indians were really in a rough point at this point. All right. Anyway, so as Tom is wandering through this forest, he comes across this little clearing where there's a bunch of trees that have been knocked down. It looks like a bunch more have been hit with a hatchet. And he comes across this strange guy. The description here, it says a great black man. Now, I want to establish with you this doesn't mean a black man like an, an African-American person. This is a like person, normal looking person, not normal looking. Let me back up. It's a person who's got black on them. It lo it's going to tell us later it looks like soot covering his body. So it's not a black person as in an African-American, so understand that right away. Some mistakes made there. People think Irving's talking, taking shots at black people by making the devil a black person. That's not the kind of person we're talking about. Anyway, he comes across this this character who looks like a woodsman, and lots of red flags. I mean, they're covered in black when he's cutting wood. There's no signs of fire. He's got red eyes. He appears out of nowhere. He seems to know things he shouldn't. He talks about, like, he has all these trees that he's been cutting on, have people's names written on them, and the ones that have fallen are dead people. Um, and he talks, like, about one that's about to fall, a deacon Peabody, who he said the devil, who we don't know is the devil yet, technically. But this random character tells Pe tells Tom that uh, this deacon Peabody is, you know, if he doesn't watch it, it's going to be dead. And he talks about the tree being hollow at the core and a good wind would shake it. And again, there's that's obviously paralleling that this character, Deacon Peabody, is actually hollow inside. It's like the devil knows about each of these people. And he's been taking little swings at each tree as they mess up till they finally die. Uh, he points out that the, um, they're sitting, I'm um, sorry, Tom is sitting on a tree that has the word crown and shield on it. And he's like, huh, uh, that's a guy who's rumored to be a pirate. As far as I know, he's still alive, though, which we're going to find out in a little bit. He's not. So that's going to be Tom's like, ah, kind of confirmation. So um, eventually the, the devil introduces himself and he goes through all the story, you know, book tales about him. And uh, oddly, Tom doesn't even bat an eyelash at this. He seems to be totally fine with the devil being there, which is so weird. And, um, the uh, he the Irving jokes that Tom's so used to his awful life that the devil seems like an improvement, honestly. So that's kind of funny. Um, they walk back to Tom's house. The devil pitches his typical. It doesn't say uh, Irving is really good about indicating that we all know what the terms are going to be. He's going to give Tom a bunch of money for and it doesn't say, but again, uh, Irving is acknowledging that this is not a unique story. This isn't the first time. This is a retelling of the Faust story from, you know, centuries before, which was about a guy selling his soul for wisdom. Now, the irony here is that Tom's not going to be selling his soul for wisdom. He's going to be selling it for possessions. And that's a much more, I mean, they're both awful, but the selling it for greed seems like a worse thing than selling it for wisdom. Although, can I establish that they're both bad? All right. Uh, Tom doesn't initially agree to this. He wants to think about it a little bit. So as he leaves, the devil puts his thumb up to his forehead and leaves a mark that's burned in there. So again, this plus finding out about this guy, Crown and Shield, who's just died, indicates he knows that this is legit. This is real. 
And then he decides to share this information with his wife, who for some reason, I mean, for, for narrative purposes, really, is the only reason he shares it with her, because normally I don't think he would. But he shares this information with her, and she, of course, is immediately on board. Yes, yes, do this. Please uh, take up the bargain, because, I mean, it's not her soul. She doesn't care. She just wants Tom to be rich so she can be rich. Uh, and a funny Tom moment, he's like, never mind. If you want it, I'm not going to do it. So he refuses. At this point, his wife decides that she's going to go seek out the devil herself. She comes back after going and seeking. She's been gone for a while. She comes back. She's mumbling. She packs up a bag and then leaves again, and then they never hear from her. So Tom gets worried because he realizes she's taken up all of his stuff of value. He's not worried about his wife. He's worried about the stuff of value. So he goes out looking for her, and he goes to the spot where he met the devil, and there's all these stories about what had happened to her, but the Tom part says that she went out. That he went out there, and he sees the bag up in a tree with a big vulture sitting on it. So vultures eat dead things. So he's excited because he's found his stuff because he doesn't really care about finding his wife. He jumps up there. He pulls it down, thinks it's going to be his silverware and his silver teapot and all of his stuff of value. Instead, he finds her heart and liver in there. Um, and, you know, again, instead of being sad that his wife's dead, he says he consoles himself with the loss of his property with the loss of his wife. So he basically considers it a wash. He got rid of her in the process and now feels better. Okay. Um, now, at this point, he starts to think about, well, maybe I will accept the devil's deal now. I mean, think about this. I've got uh, no one who's going to take the money from me. I'm going to be a rich guy. I can meet a new girl. I mean, maybe this will happen. Now, at that point, the devil plays hard to get and kind of disappeared, and Tom can't find him. So, uh, and that's that's the devil's ploy. Again, it's making sure he's got you right where he wants you. Probably the eliminating hit Tom's wife was a step to that, and now he's going to get Tom too. I had someone ask me, and it was a conversation that we had, I kind of clicked on an answer after they had left. We talked about, you know, why would the devil be so out of, go out of his way to get Tom's soul? He, Tom's a bad guy. We see that. So he probably already was going to get his soul. But I think what the key here is, is that what he's going to have Tom do is going to have more implications for maybe impacting other people. So I think that's the goal here. It's to use Tom. It's not that he's going to – wasn't already probably going to end up with Tom, but he wants to make sure he can use Tom for other things. So when the devil does show up finally, and Tom's ready to get this deal done, uh, the devil starts – they haggle about it a little bit. And then finally the devil decides, okay, I'm going to give you the money, but I want you to use it for me. Uh, I want you to use it to further my kingdom. And he initially starts with saying, I want you to be a slave dealer, which right away is a huge tone point in the story. That tells you what Irving, the writer, thinks about slavery, that it's the devil's work. Okay, So that's great. Irving's on the right side of that argument. I'm not sure about his feeling about Indians, but this one he's on the right side of. So he feels like this is what – and because he says it because even Tom, Tom's like, I don't care how bad I am. I'm not doing that. So, I mean, obviously that tells us that Irving has a very low esteem towards uh, slave owners, which he should, or slave dealers, which he should, all right? Tom decides to pitch another idea and said he decides to become a usurer, which is basically a lender. He's going to be a banker, all right? Uh, kind of funny there that those are also considered evil at this point. And the really funny part about this is found at the top of page two. Uh, this one. So I'll be honest with you, this one makes me laugh every time I read it. Um, the devil says, you shall lend money at 2% a month. Egad, I'll charge four, replied Tom Walker. The devil himself says 2% interest, and Tom's like, forget that, I'll try to charge four. You know, in that time period, that may have seemed so extreme. Today, the average credit card's in the 20s. I've seen some, not mine, thank God, but I've seen some that are in 28, 29% interest. So obviously, and I do think the credit card companies might clo be close to the devil, but um, obviously, I mean, Tom right here, they see this concept of lending money at exorbitant rates, 4%, 2%, honestly, as exorbitant. That's pretty funny how much we've come away from that. I mean, you get a 2% loan on something now, and you'd be, you know, thrilled. So Tom decides that he's going to become a user. The devil agrees. They shake hands. The devil gives him the money. And then we kind of get this um, time passage section where Tom becomes real. It's, the people in town are struggling. They're having a lot of bad times. So Tom's like right there on it, lending out money at, rates he shouldn't to desperate people. So in a way, he is doing the devil's work. He's finding desperate people and putting them in a situation where they're kind of in a bad place and they kind of have to go to him. And he's going to rip them off because he's got no soul. I mean, <laughs> about to be literally and figuratively wrong in that respect. Okay? So it says Tom was the universal friend of the needy and acted like a friend in need, but the fact is, is he's not. He's ripping these people off. When they can't pay, he seizes their stuff, and that way he becomes exceptionally wealthy. All right? But... Of course, as time goes by and he gets older and he starts thinking about the deal he made, he starts trying to figure out how he can rip the devil off. So he starts going to church. 
and becoming like the wording in the book is a violent churchgoer. In other words, he's like really passionate about this, probably not in a good way. Um, so it says he's as rigid and religious as in money matters. And then it also says his zeal became notorious as his riches. So this guy becomes, you know, I wouldn't say he becomes one of those Christians. All right. Not the good kind, the kind that's like, you know, a little bit too focused on legalism, perhaps, and things like that. So he's, you know, he thinks that he's going to loophole his way out of this by um, becoming a better Christian. And you know what, guys? Maybe that would have worked for him, except for one big thing. He never gives up the greed part. And so later on, a guy comes, he's trying to collect money, and he, this, this guy's trying to beg for more time. And Tom's like, I'm not going to do it. You've got to take care of what you owe, blah, blah, blah. The guy says, you have, I'm going to read this for you. He says, you've made so much money out of me, said the uh, speculator. Tom lost his patience and his piety. Now, piety is his religious sense, so he's lost that right here, and he makes a really bad mistake. He says, the devil take me, said he, if I have ever made a farthing. In other words, if I've ever made a penny off of you, the devil can come take me now. Well, on cue, that's me knocking, by the way. Uh, the devil shows up. Three knocks on the door, he shows up, and he's there for Tom's soul. Grabs him and tears off out of the house. You get this image. It's a funny image. It says, away went Tom Walker, dashing down the streets, his white cap bobbing up and down, his morning gown fluttering in the wind, and his steed striking fire out of the pavement at every bound. When the clerks turned to look for the black man, he had disappeared. So at this point, Tom's been being taken off to hell. Um, then when they go to uh, look at – the people don't seem to – they hear all these stories, but they're so used to all this kind of thing. Again, it's a little bit of a joke that, that uh, Irving makes about the people of Boston being so used to witches and stuff. And again, it's a shot kind of at the Salem witch trials and stuff. They go, to, go through Tom's stuff. They find out all the mortgages he had have been turned to cinders which means they no longer exist. So those people are freed from their debt, which is awesome. And all of his like stuff is turned into just garbage. It mentions uh, uh, in place of gold and silver, his iron chest was filled with chips and shavings. Two skeletons lay in his stable instead of his half-starved horses. And the very next day, his great house took fire and was burned to the ground. So everything is lost in the end. Okay, so this, this is a great story for characterization. We see lots of, I mean, you never like Tom or his wife. There's a lot of things, mainly the indirect characterization is what gives us those details. Um, it's a great example of how early American thought was influencing, um, you know, the way people who, a lot of people would read this and they would see these jokes about uh, slavers being like the devil's people and things like that. So there's a lot of that message getting out there and writers really start to have a voice now that they had, didn't have in the Puritan period and had, you know, only in a political level really during revolutionary period we had. Now is where American literature truly begins, okay? And this is one of the great early stories, all right? So if you want to know how to, like, kind of get ready for the test, remember to look on OneNote at your um, weekly agenda. There's some, like, kind of notes there about areas that I'd like to target. You also can always look at the questions at the end of the story. I don't make you guys do those because some of them are pretty dumpy, but there's a few of these that are really good and make really good test questions, which, you know, I'm not saying I'll always use them word for word, but I may take pieces and reword it and things like that. So always take a look at that too. And please, I can't stress this enough. If you are just watching this video and thinking that's going to be enough, it's not. You need to do the reading too. You need to make notes in the reading. You need to look for indirect and direct characterization. You need to get used to being an active reader where you take notes and you interact as you read. Okay. Just listening to me summarize it is it, you've taken two tests from me this year already that deal with the actual literature. It's not what I'm going to ask. So you need to do, make sure you've got more than that. Also, I need you, if you have questions to interact with me, whether you put, email me, those of you who just missed class can ask me when you're in class. You can even put comments up here right underneath the YouTube video while you're thinking about it. I'm not trying to be a professional YouTuber. Don't worry. I don't care about that. If I did, I'm definitely in the wrong business because I don't get any views. But um, if you would like to leave notes down there, I don't mind. I'll respond to them. They won't show up immediately. Mine are put where I have to okay them before they're put up. But um, for, the, for the school's sake, to be honest with you. So I'll go through all that, and I'll be sure to get back to you. So please don't just sit there at home and be confused, all right? So our next step if you're, uh, you know, is going to be to move into – what's our next story? I think it's going to be some poetry, actually. Uh, yeah, we're going to get a little bit of the Song of Hiawatha, which I've mentioned to you guys. is like the big uh, – the mythology of the U.S. Uh, and then some – of the fireside poets, you know, including Longfellow who wrote the Song of Hiawatha. So we got some poetry coming next. So some of you may be excited. Some of you may be a little bit more, in, you know, oh, no. So we'll see.
but hopefully this helped you enough to get through the Devlin Tom Walker. It's a long piece. It's got a lot of beautiful writing. Um, to get this into the 20 minute video, I'm really proud of myself. So anyway, you guys have a great afternoon, great evening. And, um, you know, I hope you enjoy the Devlin Tom Walker. The kids in class seem to really like it. Um, I love it. I think it's a terrific story. So, uh, you know, anyway, have a great evening.